This video includes flashing screens. Hello again, William here. Before we look at collisions and color in Batari Basic, what I've learned, I wanted to note this will be the last video looking at version 1 of my code. I'm currently on version 5, I think. It just takes longer to make these videos than it does to program the game. Currently, I've played around with a title screen, a game over animation, I have a working health bar, a semi-functioning inventory system, and you can drop cargo and pick it up again. I also rewrote the code for the teleporting minefield using fixed point math, which lets you do subpixel positioning. Pretty cool. Oh, and I added my first two sound effects. By the next video, I expect to have a full game loop, including win and lose conditions, but probably not multi-screens yet. And I also need to rewrite all this code more efficiently with what I've learned since I began. Okay, so let's wrap up looking at my first bit of code for Telemachus version one with a focus on collisions and color. This is where I do the collision checks. To call collisions, you use the word collision, which I thought was pretty elegant. And then in parentheses, what the two objects you're checking if they're touching or not. So in this case, I'm checking if player zero and player one are colliding. And then I'm checking if player zero and missile one are colliding. Player zero is you, the player, and player one is the health ship on the first screen anyway. Missile one is the teleporting mine, and that will be the same on every screen. The available objects that you have for collisions are player zero, missile zero, player one, missile one, the play field, and the ball. And you can list any two of these in any order. Doesn't matter, just use the if-then statements. Now this check only returns a yes or a no for the collision. It doesn't return the coordinates of where the collision occurs but the collisions are pixel perfect. There isn't any built-in bounding box, for example. And I found out, it, it's here, here again, it's particular about the spaces. So initially I just put a space there because I thought it looked, you know, a little easier to read, but you get an error. In fact, you get a fatal error. What makes it fatal? I don't know. But the source is not resolvable. So let's take a look at the first collision. If player zero collides with player one, then go to ship health. That's the routine where I change the color of the player ship. So let's look at that routine in isolation. We've got the same code that I talked about in the last video, which is the ball blink. The variable C is our counter. U is the play field and ball color. And now K, which is new. And that's the color of player zero. So currently the refuel blink and the ship health blink are using duplicated code in two separate routines. But if I can consolidate this duplicated code, maybe I can have the pulse run on every loop continuously uh, instead of buried inside of a routine. Then this way I could access the results of the blink with whatever variable I need to, whether it's the ball or player zero or some other color variable and do this before each draw screen. And then this way, every color pulse will be in sync. So after this is checked, then it's going to the collision complete, which is up here after the, my collision checks. And then the game loop is starting over. So the variation on that that I have is ship hit, which I currently have if you touch missile one and missile one is my, is my mine. And if you touch it, you're getting damaged. And what happens is this, the background is flashing and the player's sprite is flashing and the screen is shaking. So let's look at that ship hit. So here I, I'm just reminding myself what the blink colors are that I want. And these are reds and yellows. So here's the counter, C plus one. And then I have all these if then statements. If it's zero, then the color of my ship is, th is this, 68 which isn't one of these at all, is it? <laughs> and then if it's 10, set it to 62, etc. goes through, and then the color of the background is using this random, random talk. So rand 
is our random function in Batari Basic, and it gets us a number between 1 and 255. Unless you set a maximum value with the ampersand and the number you wish to use as the top value returned. However, stepping through my screen recording for this video, I saw that the background color was changing not through the entire range. In fact, it gave me a pattern of these four colors. So what's up with this? It's some kind of pseudo random, I guess. I'm not sure why it would create this particular pattern every time. I did see on forums and such, people recommend taking that top value you want and breaking it into multiple randoms. So for this example, something like random 16, 24, 28, and that would get me back to 68. However, this just seems to produce a different pattern. So random and I have yet to make friends. I'll note that if you don't want to declare a maximum value when using rand, then drop the parentheses or you'll get an error and your game won't compile. So let's look at this command called shake screen. To demonstrate this a bit clearer, hopefully, <laughs> uh, I've made this simple bounce program. So shake screen is a command in the standard kernel and for the shake to appear on screen, you have to add a value and then reduce that value back to zero. Otherwise the shake just moves everything up by one line and keeps it there. And that ties into the value that you enter. It's not the amount of lines you're shaking the screen. That will always be one line up and one line back down. Once you reset the value to zero, because the value isn't indicating how far to move the screen, it's referring to the frequency of movement. To illustrate, let's input a few values here. And I've also added the same value to the score on the bottom. So this is 16, 32, 64, and 128. And I chose 16. Let's go back here. I chose 16. Come on, I want to be there. Oh, uh, because it looked right to me as far as the shaking goes. Now let's uh, zoom in on the sample program for a little bit more information, because this is a good place to point out, since we're talking about collisions, what part of the sprites actually are detected in the collision. So here are the player sprites, player zero on the left, player one on the right. And if I replace those sprites with their code, you'll see ones and zeros. And for legibility, if I just blow up those numbers a little bit here, you can see the ball bounces against only the ones, which are the visible pixels, and passes right through the zeros, which are the unseen pixels of the sprite. The white number in the bottom left of each of these sprites, that's indicating the origin point. So when you place a sprite on the screen, in this case player 0, the x-coordinate is 37, and the y-coordinate is 48. So you're placing that bottom left pixel at those coordinates. Now to activate the shake screen, as it were, uh, we use a dim. So let's talk about dim. <laughs> dim talk. I wanted to know what DIM meant. Most tutorials, they teach you how to use it, but not what it stands for, and I was curious. So I looked it up and discovered the term goes all the way back to the original BASIC from 1964, Dartmouth BASIC. And here are some pages from the first BASIC manual. I thought this was interesting. So here's a little aside. John G. Kemeny and Thomas E. Kurtz created BASIC at Dartmouth College. These two professors were mathematicians and computer scientists. We have this photo, courtesy of Dartmouth, taken shortly after the first use of BASIC, which was demonstrated in conjunction with the Dartmouth timesharing system on May 1st, 1964, at 4 a.m. The Dartmouth timesharing system allowed multiple users to access the same CPU via teletypes in a queue, with one active user, another user at the ready, and the remaining users waiting their turn. But instead of running each job to completion before moving on to the next, the time-sharing CPU handles one job for a moment and then moves to the next one for a moment, then the next, swapping between each program in small increments until 
they are all finished in tandem. These might be the very first two basic programs, but I have not been able to confirm this to my satisfaction. Right, DIM. It was short for dimension or dimensioning and referred to creating the dimensions of an array, though I read that the term has now been recontextualized for modern use beyond arrays and can be seen as standing for declare in memory. Now in Batari Basic, this is how you can make your variables more user-friendly by assigning a text label to a single letter variable as an identifier. Batari Basic has 26 variables, A through Z. So now shake screen is a built-in label and I presume there are more, but otherwise you can assign any word you wish. And I plan to do this to clean up my code because right now it's just, you know, D equals this, F equals that. And I have to consult my, either consult my variable list or add remarks and it just read easier as the code gets more complex to use dim, which reminds me that I set this variable list and you can see I'm almost out already. The annotation says that dim is typically called at the beginning of the program, but it doesn't have to be. But since the 2600 only has 128 bytes of RAM, as you guess, variables and their data are at a premium. So here's one workaround or solution to save space in your game. And I haven't used this yet, but I will. I've learned you can take your 8-bit variables, let's say the letter B. You can break it apart and take its 8 bits, which are numbered 0 through 7, and use them to store your yes, no's, or one zero type variables. So take your variable, here's B, use the squigglies to notify the program which bit you are addressing, let's say three, and then assign a value, but it has to be one or zero. And now you've turned B into eight, yes or no Bs. And if you're wondering if you can combine this technique with calling a dim label, you can. All you have to do is set your dim, define which bit you want to use for your zero or one, and then in an if then statement, you can just call the dim label. One is considered yes, so you can just say if, and then the dim label. And if you want to check if the dim label you're using is false or zero, just use the exclamation mark. So this solution is great for yes, no situations like does this ship have cargo? Is the game over? So in a sense, you're reclaiming all those bits if you had been using all eight bits for a simple yes or no situation. For Telemachus, maybe I'll make a label for an overall ship state and then assign attributes to each bit. Uh, okay, so what was I talking about? Oh, so that's... Yeah, so that's the routine for the damage and the health. And eventually I'll have on the bottom here some kind of health indicator. I don't want to use numbers. Uh, I'm hoping I can use a, a bar or dots. And by dots, I mean squares. You see here in the collision checks, if player zero and player one are not colliding, then go to ship reset. All right, let's take a mad dash here through the Boolean operators we have in Batari Basic. These Boolean operators, they return a value which is either true or false. And in these two statements, I'm using the not Boolean operator, which is the exclamation mark. And the other two are the and, which is represented by two amperstands, and the, and the, or the, or, which is two vertical lines. And the reason for these not collision checks is that I need to reset the player graphic from flashing after a hit or a health increase to change it back from its various greens and reds. Otherwise, it'll stay that way after a collision. And I'm figuring there's got to be a different, a more, I say this a lot, but a more efficient way to do this, because this way, I think I'm checking for a not collision every frame, when really I only need to do it after a collision. So I think checking for a not collision every frame takes up those precious cycles <laughs> that I need to conserve. A quick word or two on cycles. There's clock cycles and color clocks and machine cycles, and I'm just trying to sort all this out. The processor performs instructions by clock ticks. Each tick is called a cycle. We can measure code activity in cycles. We have 76 available cycles per scan line. And if you go over this, bad things happen. 
you're just asking the 2600 to do too much in the time allotted. Uh, I'm not at the point yet where I've learned to count the cycles used by my code. I did see you can use the Stella debugger to count cycles, but I've handed that off to future me. Just as I was about to export this video, I heard an interview with Gary Kitchen talking about counting cycles for his 2600 port of Donkey Kong. Check the link below, it's pretty neat. So here I have resetting the ship, resetting its color. I found it handy to put the resetting the background color inside here as well, so color talk. All right, now the color stuff. I'm not gonna talk about CCAM or PAL, only NTSC. That's what I'm using. We have 128 colors. And you can access these colors in three ways. Binary numbers, decimal numbers, and hexadecimal numbers. You can apparently mix and match just fine. Now this was weird. When I looked online to confirm the available colors, I found differing palettes from different sources. At first glance, they might appear identical, but upon closer examination with, say, an eyedropper, you can see they do not match, which is peculiar. So I thought I'd better make my own and verify my color input and output. So I made a simple 2600 program that would output every color available. And then I took a screenshot of that and I compared that screenshot to Stella's internal palette and verified the colors matched. And my goal is just to, at a baseline, be internally consistent on my machine. You see, this hexadecimal is an 8-bit number for the Atari with two digits. But the modern computer we are likely using to make our game has 24-bit color. So our hexadecimal numbers for these very same colors are six digits. Now, 8-bit color normally gets us 256 colors, but the Atari gives us 128 colors twice. You have 128 even-numbered colors and 128 identical odd-numbered colors. A mystery. Now I have this palette that I created and the way I like to use it, I just hit quick look uh, in OS X and up it comes and I can see the color I want and there's the value. And I can also use this palette to conform my game art, the manual, the label, even the comic book eventually to the same colors. To close out this video, I always thought the black and white switch on the 2600 was performing some kind of hardware conversion of the signal of the game, but in fact all these switches, except for power, are entirely software controlled and can do whatever you like. Just check if they are true or false with an if-then statement and off you go. So if you do want to use the black and white switch to swap your color palette to a grayscale palette, you can do that manually by redefining the colors. Additionally, in Stella you can map these switches however you like to your computer. So go to Options, Input, look for the console events, and there are your switches. All right, next time we might look at the inventory system and the health system and the minefield or something else entirely. Thanks for watching.